Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, guys, so let's get started. Uh, welcome to another Vaccination Data Race Summer Series. We're excited today to have Michael Rundstrom. Um, he is the head of product at Hotworks, uh, where he's been working on, on RunDB. Michael got his PhD from the University of Lipnich. Um, I'm butchering that one, uh, but in Sweden. Uh, he's been working on NDB, which is the, the, the backbone of MySQL cluster, for over 20 years now. And since then, he's spun NDB off as uh, RunDB as part of this kind of larger Hotworks uh, platform that they're building. So uh, as always, if you have any questions for Michael, I just given this talk. Please unmute yourself, say who you are, and ask a question at any time. That way he feels like it's a conversation. And we thank uh, Michael for being here because he's in Sweden and it's it's 10.30 at night. So we appreciate him staying up late to, to talk about his database. Michael, the floor is yours. Go for it. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. So uh, RunDB is, as mentioned, is a fork of something called MySQL NDB cluster, which uh, originated within Ericsson, uh, in the 90s and has been developed uh, uh, a long time since then and is still actually developed in, inside of Oracle. And uh, so I'm going to go through today a little bit more about the requirements that started the project and continue to lead the project, so to say. I'm going to talk a little bit about LATS, what that is, uh, about the architecture of RONDB, use cases, how do we do high availability, some of the basics about data distribution and, and a lot of other things. And then at the end, I'm going to do some deep dive. And particularly, I'm planning to do a deep dive into how we do checkpoints in RONDB. Uh, so that's more of where we go into details. Uh, so a little bit about NDB in the beginning. I mean, I've always been very interested in numbers, uh, still am. And when you do benchmark, you get numbers. So I always have, have this keen interest in getting things to work faster and faster and faster. So that, that's always been an interest in, for me. And, and so one of the things about RONDB is that we try to always make it very fast, both with throughput, low latency, high availability, and now also scalable storage. So. <laughs> I, I, we have a lot of interesting uh, benchmarks uh, competitions in the past. And uh, the most lucky one was one where we, we had the competitor was organizing the, the benchmark and we still won the benchmark. That was a pretty nice one when they, they actually changed the rules three times just to try to win it. But we still won three times. So can you, can you name names? We'll, we'll bleed it out. Uh, well, the other ones were internal databases inside of Ericsson, and then there was a, a database called Clustra, which uh, was bought by Sun in the two, 20 years ago, and it's not, nowadays it's gone from the earth. Anisia was one of them. Okie doke. So let's move into requirements. So the original uh, requirements came from the telecom systems. And the idea here was that you had tens of interactions. When, when you have, for example, you started a mobile telephone call. So you get a number of interactions, 10, 20, 30 interactions with the database. Uh, you have to do all of those in 10 milliseconds, even at high load. That's the requirement. Uh, because people, they are waiting to connect their telephone calls, so they don't appreciate waiting too much. Obviously, extreme availability. Networking applications is another category. For example, a DNS server, DHCP server, AAA servers, you name it, they all have extreme availability, but they don't have the same requirements on throughput and latency, but availability always on. Gaming applications, they are more about complex interactions and high availability. And the latest uh, 
thing that RONDB is focusing on now is machine learning applications. And they can have tens to hundreds of interactions within a few tens of milliseconds. And again, there's a user waiting, so you have to complete those. Even at high loads, it has to complete within a few tens of milliseconds. And you can have tens of thousands of such interactions. So there was a benchmark which was performed by Spotify where they tried this out and they had 40,000 interactions per second and they had 200 records that they retrieved in each interaction. And another thing about machine learning applications is that here the size of the storage can grow to all the way up to petabytes. So if we put that together in a technical level, we have the latency requirements. We have to basically, it's driven by users waiting for the database transactions. And it's mobiles, finance, gaming, Availability, downtime equals no phone calls, no social media interaction, no internet, no financial transactions, no business. So obviously downtime is completely forbidden. Throughput is driven by the many tens of thousands of interactions leading to many millions of uh, key lookups per second. And scalable storage is driven by, well, it's driven by data and many, many millions of users. Okay, so that was the LATS property. So what do we do with RONDB with that? We had a key value lookup latency, which is around 100 to 200 microseconds, and that's at high load. So that's not the sort of at low load. Even at high load, we have these latency numbers. And then we have to get down to about 30 seconds of downtime per year, at least we in some systems. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what you actually need to do in order to get there. And then each CPU in, in the data nodes uh, have to handle about a couple of hundred thousand lookups per second. So that leads that, that each server can do many millions of lookups per server. And that leads to that the cluster should be able to do uh, at, at the level of billions of lookups per second. So we're talking per second here all the time. And when it comes to storage, RONDB scales to 16 terabytes of in-memory storage per data node. And you can at the same time have hundreds of terabytes of disk storage per data node as well. So obviously you can scale to fairly large sizes because we can have up to 64 data nodes in RONDB. So then we go into the architecture. So this uh, slide is uh, something that uh, anyone that wants to build a database has to understand fully and completely. And I could probably give a lecture on this for one hour, but I'm not going to do that. But essentially, they, you have to define where do we want to put the data server APIs? Where do you want to put the query server APIs? Do you want to put them inside the database? Do you want to have a distributed architecture? So if we look at what we have in RONDB, you can see here that we have the data in the data nodes. We have the actual application code or uh, server code is in another layer. So we, we, we have, for example, a MySQL server that can access the data. You can access the data from a C++ application. You can access the data from a Java application. You can access the data from a Node.js application. You can also write an LDAP server on top of uh, up on top of it. And in June, we're also going to provide a REST API towards RONDB. So as you can see, it's an architecture that is not just meant for an SQL database. It's meant for SQL, it's meant for LDAP, it's meant basically as a generic uh, data server, not so much as a database, it's more of a data server. So it can serve many purposes and it can actually serve those purposes at the same time. Okay, so use cases. Here's a good example of how you can combine all those things uh, in a telco system. You can have LDAP servers and at the same time have SQL statements being executed and you can have uh, special telco applications that takes care of HTTPS, CLI, radius and so forth. So, so as you can see here, you have many ways to access your data. And this is a sort of, this is what 
what kind of tradition from the telco arena that NDB took, took and has then developed further into RONDB today. This is a very simple system, a DNS server. So looking up, uh, translating internet addresses to IP addresses, obviously you need to have very high availability, but this application is written directly towards the C++ API. So here we only have one API. Here's another application and financial application, the stock exchange. So you have all the changes on the, on the coming in from real times. You have the stock order feed where, where the actual updates come from. And then you can get the real time stock quotes from the Java application. So this is a pretty typical application of NDB and could of course also be a typical application for RONDB. This is an example of where we actually had uh, some researchers at the KTH that uh, they started with a Hadoop uh, file system, a distributed file system, which actually had a bottleneck in that there was only one metadata server. And then you could use journal notes and Zookeeper to make it highly available. But uh, <coughs> uh, they wanted to have a more scalable architecture. So that, then they brought in RONDB for that. So after RONDB was added, they had a completely scalable architecture with any number of name nodes, any number of RONDB data nodes, and any number of uh, file server data nodes where the actual large files were stored. And you could even store some of the files in the RONDB data nodes. So this is a file system that we're actually using in, in Hopsworks. So everything we do in machine learning uh, actually depends on this file system. So we have a backend file system and this also uh, is, is working on top of RONDB. So when we are selling to customers a feature store, they can use, uh, they can store their machine learning features for online usage directly in RONDB, but they can also store things for offline feature store features. They can store that in this distributed file system. So, so we can have really massive amounts of data in Hopsworks. So I, I mentioned that uh, we wanted to support 30 seconds of downtime per year, less than that. So we actually had uh, for, for many years, uh, we even had uh, downtimes uh, on a pretty high level that was down to less than one second per year. But of course, uh, humans program systems. So that meant that uh, eventually you always get uh, this large crash. So, so after a while, you always get to around 30 seconds of downtime per year because humans cannot really make things better than that, I would say. So that means that uh, in order to go, get to that, you actually have to have replication both in a cluster, but also between clusters so that you can survive earthquakes and, and other things. And we have a pretty advanced system uh, in, in handling this. And the, the author that I noticed that he's here today, Fraser Clement. So he's actually the, one of the main authors behind this part. So, but I'm not going to talk so much more about that today. So just want to mention that as well as, yeah. You said it, you said it quite sophisticated. Can you, like, is it like a one sentence that says what makes it special? Is well, it good engineering or is there something more fundamental like theoretical? It's, uh, it has uh, conflict detection, which is pretty advanced actually. I, I don't really know of any other system that has such an advanced conflict detection system. So you can more or less run transactions and have basically discover exactly which conflicts that you in interfered with. And, and based on that, you can write an application that resolves those conflicts. So quite advanced, I would say, but it's probably too advanced to, for, for normal users. But from a research point of view, it's probably very interesting to study it. But again, it would take hours to explain all of that. 
And if you're really interested, I wrote a few chapters about it in a book, which is called MySQL Cluster 7.5 Inside and Out. That's some chapters on that. Okie doke. So in the cloud, you have to sort of, I mean, you have, you have uh, virtual machines in a cloud. Uh, in order to get the highly available database cluster in a cloud, you actually have to make sure that you put the, the virtual machines in the correct uh, availability zones. Actually, I mentioned here failure zones as well. So some clouds can also have within an availability zone. Oracle Cloud can do that. I'm pretty sure that uh, Azure can do that. Uh, not 100% sure about all the others. So what, what is needed here is that you need to make sure that I haven't really introduced node groups yet, but think about node group as a shard. And so basically that means that, that you have to make sure that all the nodes within a shard are placed on different availability zones. And then the MySQL service, you can actually scale them any way you want because uh, they're, as long as you can access the MySQL server, it can access the, it can access the rest of the cluster. So uh, we also provide managed RomDB. So this is for when our customers want to use RomDB. They, they, the only thing they need to do is to create a cluster. They need to specify the number of replicas. They need to specify the VM type of the data nodes. They need to specify the number of node groups, so shards. They need, they need to specify the block storage size, or basically the file system size, and the number of MySQL servers and the virtual machine type for that. And also they can add API nodes if they like to have some special applications. So it's really simple to create a cluster. You just specify those things and then say, start. And even more interesting is what happens when you want to, when you discover that your cluster is actually too small. Let's say that you wanted to start really small. You started with one replica and, and four gigabytes of memory. And now you want to grow to two replicas and 16 gigs of memory instead. Instead, So the only thing you need to do is to change the number of replicas, specify the new VM type, and then basically just say submit. And, and then uh, the software will, will make sure that this change happens and it happens online. So, uh, so you can continue uh, sending transactions to the cluster and it will st still operate. And if you wanna go down from two replicas to one replica, that can be done. You can go up to three replicas. You can change, it's, it could be a bit, uh, uh, to go down is always more difficult than to go up, but because it could, you could actually end up in a situation where you don't have enough memory. But if, if you have enough memory, you can go down as well. So this is the interface and how it looks. I'm not going to go into any details, but it's, as you can see, it's not, you don't need to be a data, database expert to, to start a cluster. You only need to know some something about what you what you want to do, and this is the interface when you want to change the cluster, and then you get the list of the changes to be submitted, and then our software will make sure that you that these changes happen in an online fashion. It will actually not do all of them at once. It will do one one thing at a time to make sure that the cluster stays online all the time. Okay, so let's go into some basics about, uh, about things. I'm just wondering, let me just I just need to keep track of time so that I don't you're, you're good. talk too much. So I I already talked a little bit about node groups. So at the very beginning when NDB was designed, you there was this choice actually, how, how do you distribute data? I mean, there's one way of distributing data where you optimize on quick recovery. And you can also choose to optimize on 
surviving the maximum number of, of failures. So I decided to go for the variant where we survive as many failures as possible. So this means that if I have uh, two node groups, for example, with two nodes in each, that means that I can survive up to two node failures actually at the same time even. If I have one node group with three replicas, I can survive one, two failures as well, but they have to happen one at a time. So I cannot survive two at the same time. So, so we can actually survive quite a few failures at the same time, given that we have focused on high availability and not on. So that means that when you, when you recover, you are always using nodes in the same node group. So that means that when we distribute the data, we, we split the data into partitions, in horizontal partitioning. And then we decide that this partition goes into this node group, this partition goes into the second node group, the next one goes into node group zero again, the next one goes into node group one again. But we also distribute the primary partition in an, in an efficient way. So, so that we have a fair, fair load on the data nodes and, the, and, and on the CPUs. So this is perfectly classic uh, uh, data distribution using hashing. So we have a hash, a distributed hash, which we use to perform the partitioning. Uh, very short about the commit protocol. So RondeB also supports transactions. So actually everything that happens in RondeB is performed by transactions. So if you have studied two-phase commit, uh, you might be aware of that there is one variant of two-phase commit, which is called linear two-phase commit. And what you can see here is that we do linear commit for each row. So that means that we first send the commit to the primary and then to the backup and then sort of back to the transaction coordinator and then we go back again. So that means that we actually save some communication. But if we have a transaction that involves multiple rows, then those happens in parallel. So, so we do sort of have an optimization, but we don't do linear commit completely. We do sort of a, an, a mix of normal two-phase commit and, and, uh, and uh, linear commit. And one, one problem that you have probably heard about is that the uh, two-phase commit is a blocking protocol, but we actually solve that problem in the way that whenever a node fails, whenever that TC transaction coordinator fails, we will take that transaction coordinator and rebuild it. So we will basically rebuild the state of that transaction coordinator so that we can abort or commit all transaction that it was, that it was handling at the moment when it crashed. And we can do that because all of the nodes, the participants are still operating or, or not all of them, but enough of them are operating so that we can still get the state. So that's why we actually do have two-phase commit, but it's non-blocking. You, you log all your two-phase commit messages to disk? Uh, we don't log the actual two-phase commit. We log uh, later on when we do a group commit. So we, we essentially have two phases where we, the first phase is what we call network durable. So that means that it will survive crashes, but it won't survive a cluster crash. And then every second we, we make sure that, that all those transactions that committed the last second are also forced to disk. So that means that we are disk durable after one second, but we are network durable as you commit. Thanks. Okay, and now we go a little bit into the row structure. So we don't really have any advanced uh, data structures, uh, I wouldn't say. I mean, it's a fairly standard. So we have a fixed size columns, which have obviously for fixed size columns for in memory. And the, the, that's obviously the very fastest uh, 
that you can read and write. We also have a variable size in memory part. Uh, it also has a dynamic part. The dynamic part is very important because that means that you can add columns uh, without uh, sort of any, you can do that as an online operation. Uh, and one of the things that I'm adding right now, which is almost ready, is that we also will have variable size on disk columns. So that means that you will be able to add also disk columns dynamically without any downtime for the system or for the tables. We have an index date, we have two indexes. We have a distributed hash table. If you're interested in, in learning more about that, you can search for my PhD thesis. It's called LH raised to three because it's hashing in three steps. It's very, very much uh, intertwined with CPU caches. And it's been very, very successful all the years. So uh, that's at least one of the reasons why RondeB has so good performance. We also implemented an ordered index, which is an in-memory ordered index, which is using a T-tree. Uh, you can read about that. Uh, there's an article in 1990s on T-trees. It's nothing. I mean, it's basically not that different from other binary indexes like T-trees and so forth, but it's specialized for in-memory. Uh, so, if you look I mean, here, yep. Have you done? Have you done? I mean, maybe get into the T tree. I don't know if it gives a debate whether T tree makes sense. Like, weren't there a bunch of papers that came out in the 2000s that basically said, like, the, the indirection of having to do lookups for the rows all the time in T trees is detrimental to like almost superscalar architectures? So, we did, we did benchmarks when we implemented T trees and compared it to a B tree. And actually, the result was that. Uh, uh, they had the same performance. So I wouldn't how say long, that. How long ago was this benchmark? That was 20 years ago. No, no, 15 years ago. So, okay. So there, there, there was superscalar CPUs, but, uh, but uh, not very much more than that. I think it's you guys are the only ones using T-Trees then that I'm aware. I know there's Extreme DB, because Times 10 was using T-Trees T, T too, and they got rid of it. Or like it's it's you can get B plus, B plus trees by default, so this is this is rare. This is awesome. Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, we we were more or less uh, uh, sort of we, we we had a choice: do we want to go with the T trees or do we want to go with B trees? I mean, they had the same performance, and uh, so we just decided we we'll go for the T trees and and. I wouldn't say that the T trees uh, sort of has been the focus. I mean, it's really key lookups through the hash key that has been, is really, really the focus. But nowadays I would say that uh, uh, we also do scanning very, very efficiently. So, so I'm pretty sure that T trees is not the optimal solution, but it's also implemented fairly efficiently. So. It's definitely not a sort of significant problem for us. Let's be clear, like so Ron DB has it and then therefore NDB has it, correct? Oh yeah. This is okay. like uh, implementing a T tree is definitely a few years of work. So Got it. You, don't, okay. you don't sneeze it out of your nose like that. <laughs> so okay. So this, uh, now I'm going into the, uh, what we call the virtual machine architecture, but I actually removed the name virtual machine here because it might be a bit, you, you're, you're probably thinking about virtual machines as virtual machines in clouds and in operating systems, but uh, what virtual machine here is more actually the term virtual machine, it's not. So basically here we are just having a, a layer that takes care of sending messages between, uh, so we have three layers here. We have blocks, which is essentially modules of software. We have threads that contains a number of those modules. And we have nodes, which are essentially processes. So whenever you send a message in RONDB, you send it to a node, a thread, and a block. And we have this architecture that makes sure that you can sort of direct it so you can go 
internally in a thread, you can go to another thread in the same node and you can do a send receive over to another node. And the nice thing is that from a program, programmatical point of view, you don't really see what you're doing. It's only the address that tells you where it's going. So that's an interesting part of the RomDB implementation. Another thing that we've added lately to, and this is actually that started in MDB, but completed in RomDB. And that's the memory architecture where we now have completely taken care of all the data so that uh, we, we sort of manage the entire data memory inside something we call shared global memory. So effectively, when you start a data node, you more or less, the idea is that you take care of all the memory in the machine, except what the operating system needs and so forth. And then we automatically decide how much memory is going to be used by the different parts. But there is also flexibility. So if, if for some reason you need more transaction memory uh, at the moment, then you can steal that from some other parts. And if you need a lot of query memory, which is used for complex queries, well, then you can use that. So we, we, we manage data much more efficiently nowadays. Okay, and then we have the thread architecture. So this is an interesting topic that uh, again could be discussed for, and it, this is actually one of the most important reasons why RomDB is, is fast. Uh, so uh, I actually have written two or three blogs about uh, something I call thread pipelining. So as you can see here, we actually, when, when we handle a key lookup, it's not handled by one thread. It can handle by up to four threads. So you get you come into the receive thread that takes care of TCP IP sockets. You send it over to a TC thread, which takes care of transaction handling. You go into a data manager or query thread to take care of the actual database operation. And then you go into send thread to actually send the response back or to another node to handle update of the other replicas. So we had some uh, uh, experiments done to see sort of how does this architecture compare to a single thread architecture where you do everything in one thread. And it turns out that this is much more efficient. And, but read the blog if you're interested. There's a lot of data about why it's faster and, and so forth as well. Is this, I mean, this is basically theta. This is basically what? Theta, the stage event driven architecture from like um, Matt Walsh from the early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, it's, like, it's, it's a message, message passing architecture where we actually have message passing even between threads internally. I'll, I'll, post, it, I'll post the link in the chat here. We can cover this later. Yep. Okay, and another thing we added lately, I mean, uh, most databases that do key value operations, they are often designed in such a way that they partition the data based on, on the partition. And there's one partition taking care, is taken care of by one CPU. And we, we had that architecture in MDB and in RomDB for a long time. But uh, in, lately I've actually added the possibility that read reads, key reads are actually possible to do also by what I call here query threads. So query threads, they can actually execute operations for any uh, partition. And obviously that means that there has to be some mutexes and things like that. Uh, so that means that we have to have a scheduler for those read operations. And that scheduler actually takes care to make sure that that we only use query threads that share L3 cache with the actual data owning thread. Because writes, they are still performed by the data owning thread. So we have to make sure that query threads that reads the data, that they don't go and read data from the wrong CPUs. Uh, it's mostly in AMD CPUs that this matters. So because they have this, uh, uh, well, what's, 
they, they basically develop the CPUs in a different way compared to Intel and ARM. So we'll see what happens with Intel and, and ARM CPUs if they go the same route. Can we go back to the previous slide, sorry. Do what? Go back, go back to the previous slide. Yeah. Oh yeah, so all right, so this this is what there's a bunch of operations and you have this LDM thread, and you're basically saying when the when the LDM thread has nothing to do, you're pushing onto its like, a, like work queue to go do, do something, right? It, it, like is that what this is? Yeah, so actually it's a kind of I mean again, this is something you could talk about for one hour because it's really philosophical, because uh you spent when the TC receive threads, they don't really know uh, on a detailed level about how loaded those threads are. So what we do is that every 50 milliseconds, we distribute data about the load level. But that's a fairly long time in a CPU. So we also take care of looking at queue levels. So, and that means that we at least know what has happened one millisecond ago. So based on that information, we choose whether we go to the LDM thread or whether we go to a query thread. And so we have very, very, very detailed information about the load level and the, que the queue levels on, on each other thread that can handle the query. And then we put it into the queue and then once it's in the queue, then it will be handled by that thread. It's sort of like, like Coroutines, right? Like, like it's sort of like you're basically saying, all right, the the TC receive thread says I gotta do some work, but let me go if I can. Let me shove it down to the LDM thread if I think it's idle and can take care of it. That's the gist of it. Yeah, more or less. That if the LDM thread is sufficiently idle, go there, and then we have a special query thread. That if you look at this picture, you can see that there is a query thread that operates on the same core. And if that's available, then that will be uh, will be used. If both of those CPUs are very heavily used, and there is another one that's not so heavily used, then we can put it on a on a different CPU core, but still on the same L3 cache. Uh, All right, understand. Yep. So that that uh, was kind of interesting. It's the first time I've been reading a physical book about time and philosoph philosophy and apply that within a computer server. <laughs> kind of interesting. At least I thought so. So some RondeB resources uh, before I dive into the, to the advanced stuff about checkpoints. So RondeB.com, obviously. So if I have time, I will also show you a little bit about this YCSP benchmark. It's kind of cool because it's the first time, in, as far as I know, that somebody has published numbers on a benchmark when you're doing recovery at the same time as you're running the benchmark. So we provide numbers both on throughput and on latency while the recovery is ongoing and also when the crash is happening. So go there and have a look and see if you have some in, get some interesting ideas. Okay, now I'm going to go into the rest of the time into a topic. I guess it's about ten minutes left or something like that. Or yeah, like fifteen twenty minutes. Okay, so partial checkpoints is something that I actually spent almost two and a half years on that project. So it's uh, recovery architecture is inherently complex, not so much because it's more complex than other code, but mostly because the crash happens not when you did the pro when you had the bug. It happens much later. So the only way to find the bug is to do extremely extensive logging, and that of course means that you're changing the the timing and so forth. So it's sometimes pretty hard to to find the problem. But uh, the reason for changing the checkpointing scheme is pretty easy. So, so we used to have a full checkpoint and I looked on other databases that are in memory databases. And I, so as far as I've seen, most of them still use full checkpoints. 
And if you look at what that means, it means that if you have a, an in-memory data size of, for example, 16 terabytes, it's pretty obvious that, uh, that uh, it's going to be hard to do a full checkpoint because that takes ages to, to write to disk. So we wanted to have an architecture that supports in-memory sizes up to 16 terabytes. We want to be able to survive with a redo log of 64 gigabytes, whatever the workload. We want to be able to have a checkpoint on disk which size, which is no more than 60% more than the actual data size. And with compression, it should be even smaller than the data size. And this is obviously driven by memory size is growing in the introduction of SSDs. The 64 gigs log size, that's just like, that's a number you guys came up with, right? That's not something specific to, to RoundDB. I came up with that simply because that's what was required when, when I was running at the very, very high load. Okay. So with 32 gigabytes, I wasn't really able to, to get it completely stable in all workloads. Obviously with most workloads, even four gigabytes would be okay. But uh, I always test with very, very, very tough workloads. So, and with 64 gigabytes, more or less everything works. This is not the right time for this conversation, but like, is YKB a really tough workload if you configure it a certain way or that, like that's not even like in the ballpark where you, what you guys are considering as a tough workload? So the, the workload that uh, I used for testing was uh, low. Uh, I can show that. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit here. So the test case that we used was actually loading data into TPCC mm. with DBT2. So we had 53,000 warehouses. So basically five terabytes of in-memory data that we load at about uh, 1 million records per second or something like that. That's impressive, yeah. Yeah, so that, that was the test case. So we were fortunate enough to have Intel loan us a persistent memory server. So otherwise it's kind of hard to get, get hold of a machine with five terabytes of data in memory. Okay, so, so what, what we concluded is that the full checkpoint isn't really practical beyond 200 gigabytes of memory. And when we, when we were thinking about how to solve this, obviously one solution would be to simply use page-based checkpoints the same way as a disk database does. Uh, and I was thinking, well, why not? But then I sort of made some calculations. How would it happen if I have a database of 16 terabytes or one terabyte even here only, and I do a page-based checkpoint with 1 million rows committed per second? And it turns out that the page page checkpoint has to write 320 gigabytes, whereas the row based checkpoint only has to write four gigabytes. So that's 80 times more efficiency with row based checkpoints. So obviously, row based checkpoints is a lot more complex, but if it's 80 times better, well, you go down the drain and, and do the complex, complex stuff. So that a row-based check, partial checkpoint means that you write all the changed rows since the last checkpoint. So you will, basically, the, in a sense, the checkpoint is sort of an extra redo log. And you could probably, if you really spend time on it, you could probably combine it with a redo log, but we didn't do that. Uh, but you also have to write a subset of all rows in, a, in each checkpoint. And what we did was that we divided RomDB uses a row ID, which consists of a page ID and a page index. And we basically divided the page IDs into 2048 parts. And from zero to 2048 parts were checkpoint in each checkpoint. And each table partition is handled independent of others. Recovery applies checkpoints based on a control file per table partition. And you go, you always start with the oldest data files and go to the last one. So that means that some rows will actually be inserted more than once. 
And I'm not going to go into details, but there are some interesting mathematical uh, in, in, intricacies in, in that. That was kind of interesting. Uh, this I already mentioned that we need to avoid running out the redo log. So again, we, we have in Rondeby, we have quite a few adaptive algorithms and checkpoint speed is one of those adaptive algorithms where we keep track of CPU usage, we keep track of redo site, how much redo we have used, how much uh, writing we have actually done to, to the database. And all of those things are put into a sort of, into some computational efforts. And then we, we come up with a checkpoint speed. So that means that if you write faster, we will checkpoint faster. If you have problems with the IO, we will have to slow down for a while. If you use CPUs quite heavily, we will also slow down temporarily the checkpoint thing. So we, we always try to sort of to provide something which is good, but obviously if the redo log, if you're almost running out the redo log, we will start spinning up the speed quite heavily. And the test case as mentioned was uh, DBT2 with 63,000 warehouses where each warehouse is about 100 megabytes of data. There is some interesting problems. Uh, so checkpoint is complicated since pages can actually be dropped both during scans and between checkpoints. So in the middle of this uh, long development, I actually had some doubts whether this algorithm would actually work. So I had to write a proof, not so much for everybody else, but even for myself, I had to prove to myself that this algorithm actually works. So if you look into the code, you can actually find a 10 to 30 page long proof of the algorithm. So if anybody's interested in seeing if it's actually works, then feel free to do it. So basically this is just to give you an idea about the complexity that you can find. Uh, let's see. So when we're scanning a page, we have, a, we have a, on each row, we have a timestamp and the timestamp is implemented by what the, the thing I talked about previously, the global check global checkpoint, which is a sort of group commit executed once per second. So, so that's the level of if, if something has happened the last second, uh, we will write that row. If not, we will ignore it. Uh, and also there's some, some work to do when you're writing a row, you have to sort of decide whether the checkpoint has actually already passed it or if it's still to do the checkpoint thing because checkpoints have to be, uh, the checkpoints are fussy, but they are actually transaction consistent at the same time. So probably doesn't explain enough, but. Yeah, what, what do you mean by that? But they're fuzzy, but they're also consistent? Well, fuzzy is, means that you don't have to lock anything when you're doing the checkpoint. Uh, yes. Transaction consistent and actually even action consistent means that, that the checkpoint actually restores a very, very specific uh, point in time. So you have to restore exactly what happened when you started the checkpoint. And the reason for that is that we have to actually have, have we have pointers that points from in-memory data to disk data. So if we don't have a complete synchronization of, of that checkpoint, we wouldn't, those pointers would be able to point to the wrong place. You, are, they, are you switching to like a multi-version mode when you start the checkpoint so you have like a consistent snapshot? Yeah, basically we're doing a consistent snapshot. And, and that means that every time that you make a write, you actually have to check whether a checkpoint is ongoing. So it's a sort of, a, a sort of similar to this uh, 
uh, when you have a page space, then you basically do a consistent snapshot of pages. But here it's for rows instead. So when you check to see is, is, a, is a checkpoint occurring, what does that writing thread do? Does it not overwrite and make a copy or does it like wait? What, what does it do? And that's what it says here. It's, it basically oh. writes the row ID into a checkpoint keep list. So that means that, uh, that when you commit the transaction, you actually save the old version of the, ro of the row until, okay, okay, okay. until you have time to actually write it to disk. Okay, I right. vault to be just something similar. This makes sense. Yep. Yeah, I think okay. this is, uh, it's definitely not unique for RonDB, but it's, it's a kind of problem that if you so make the solution in a certain way, you have to solve this problem. And I think uh, probably skip this. Uh, so this is also an important point that if we have one terabyte of 300 byte rows, that's about 3 billion rows. So if we need to check each of those rows, that will take several seconds of CPU time just to do that. So we had to do a little bit of optimization for that. And so each page has a two, two level change map. So that means that we're using 136 bits in the page header to optimize the checkpoints. So that means that if you only have one write in a page, uh, it's sufficient to check those 136 bits and check one part out of 128 of the rows in that page. So this means that we more or less can skip 99% of the rows, we can skip them when sometimes even more than that. So that this is important to sort of to make sure that the checkpoint in itself doesn't consume all CPU power. And we could it could be necessary to go, go even further and have change maps on megabytes and so forth, but this seemed to be sufficient for us. Okay, um, let's see. I think that uh, this is a good time to start uh, seeing if there are questions that anybody else wants to dive into or have something specifically that they want to know yeah. a little bit more about. Are you finishing the talk or, or, or like what? Sorry. Are you, are you, like, is, is this the end of the other presentation of the slide? No, I mean, I actually have, uh, I can talk a little bit more about one thing more at least that's quick and so this one I you think want... is kind of cool as well. Yeah, so go we for it. We have something called uh, adaptive CPU spinning. So again, this is adaptive. So CPU spinning means more or less that you have a thread, you don't have anything to do. So what do you do? You, you go to sleep or do you stay awake? And in the past, we had a fixed a static CPU spinning. So basically we said that let's spin for 100 microseconds independent of what happened. But what we did, now is that we have adaptive CPU spinning. So we actually, we measure how much activity that we have. So this means that we can, we have sort of a, a guesstimate on how long time it will take until we will be woken up again. And we also uh, calculate how much time does it take to actually wake up. And then we have three different levels of how active you wanna be. Do you wanna be so active that you only uh, uh, say that you are more or less efficient or do you wanna focus on low latency but at a, a reasonable level or do you wanna be a database machine and more or less keep awake as much as possible to give the best latency whatsoever even if it costs a bit. Another nice thing about spinning is that if you're in a hyper-threaded CPU, you actually spinning, you use, uh, if it, you use special machine, op, uh, you use special 
uh, what's the name? In CPU instructions. And when those are executed, the other CPU in the same core will be much more efficient. So that means that CPU spinning in a hyper-threaded CPU almost comes for free. So that's another nice thing about it. I have also lots of slides on how we do networking. I think that uh, that would take us pretty far into, into the night if I started using that. But maybe one thing I could say is, is about this. So, so we actually have, when, you, when we are communicating inside a node, we are communicating to memory buffers. And so we implemented that in such a way that each input buffer has a single reader and a single writer concept. So that actually means that we don't have to do any mutexes in order to send the message from one thread to another thread. It does, however, require, require the use of memory barriers. So memory barriers is something that's required in order to, to make sure that the other side actually see the operations in the same order as we wrote them. And so, there are two types of memory barriers. There are write memory barriers that ensures that the receiving CPU sees all writes up to a certain point. And we have a read memory barrier that ensures that the receiving CPU sees all writes written by the sending CPU. And actually, in order to, to have a proper thing here, you have to follow this protocol that you see here so that you have to use a write memory barrier on the sending side, and you have to use a read memory barrier on the receive side. And you have to make sure that you update the head pointer before the memory barrier or after the memory barrier, I mean, and that you have to write the message before the memory barrier. So you have to be a bit careful when you're writing, but in this way, you can actually communicate without locks. And actually, you can even implement this using distributed memory. Uh, we used that in a previous version of NDB, but we have, nowadays that happens in, in the device driver instead. So we don't support it internally in RONDB anymore. I guess. In, in the sake of time, I'm going to wrap up. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I could pro I could talk for five, 10 minutes more, but uh, it's up to you if you want to. I, I have a two-year-old downstairs, so I can't, sorry. I mean, I, I, I was, I'm I already into the section that uh, I didn't really think I would get into, so. <laughs> okay, all right, do you have like a last slide? Like, we're hires like that, or is this, it just ends? Uh, no, I don't really have. Uh, let's see if I had something at the end. The CEO's on the call. You got you. Know, you got to push it. Well, I, we definitely hired. At the, <laughs> I wrote that in my la, la, last blog. <laughs> got it. Okay, yeah, all right, so yeah. I'll. Yep. I'll, I'll I'll clap and have everyone else. Uh, so we'll open up to the audience. We have time for one or two questions. If anyone wants to go for it. Yep. So. My question would be, we Ron DB, or sorry, well, NDB and now Ron DB, this was your PhD dissertation, right, from the 90s. Um, okay. You've been working on this for 26 years, uh, which is rare, right? There's, you know, there's older than SQL light, which is like, you know, there's one guy doing SQL light. Um, Monty has my SQL, but there's been a lot of people touching that, touching that code. But this has sort of been your baby. So what's the vision? Like, like, what's the next 20, 26 years look like for, for Ron DB for you? Like, what, like an ideal scenario? So I, I think that uh, uh, the feature store is obviously the first couple of years. And uh, what that means is that we want to be, be able to also handle much more data on disk. We want to be able to to scale to more nodes. We want to be able to scale down from nodes. We want to be able to do even more operations online. Uh, 
Another thing that I'm hoping that uh, th this is something that is mostly worked upon inside of Oracle. So, but I'm I'm hoping that the Oracle team will deliver also some work on on complex queries. So we actually, when I was at Oracle, we did quite extensive work on Optima to also make sure that uh, Rondeb can work efficiently pushing down joins. And so at the moment we can do we can do twelve way joins inside of the data nodes, but we we still haven't got support for aggregation. We haven't support for max and means and things like that. So, so that I'm hoping that it will come up. And then obviously, uh, the next step would be to be able to do a little bit more of a hybrid architecture, where we also move into a sort of we we still want to be a sort of online database, but it would be nice to also be able to do some more analytical queries more efficiently. So that might mean that we have to implement some uh, columnar level optimizations. Compression is obviously in something else. I, I have satisfied myself with thinking 10, 15 more years. I'm not thinking that I'm going to work more than 15 years at most more. So, I mean, I'm <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Think 25 years ahead, but somebody else has to implement the, la the last 10 years at least. Yes. Maybe the, actually that's one aspect of Brown to be or then to be that I didn't quite understand. I didn't realize that like there is actually execution engine logic. Like it's not just get and fetch, like get and delete, get set and delete, right? The other, you can, there is an execution engine on there that you could do some, like as you said, joins. Um, yeah, it's so. a quite quite advanced thing, actually. So it's uh, called linked joins, I think it's called. So so we, we, we have uh, some queries can be quite efficient, actually. But uh, unfortunately, not all queries.